Leopoldo Lopez, you are, I don't even know how to describe you. You know, your experience is the kind of stuff we see in movies. And if, if we were told it was real, we wouldn't believe it. Let's catch people up. Let's do the, the, the brief history of how you found yourself in jail and solitary confinement for four years. <laughs> um, <laughs> you were the leader of the opposition party in Venezuela. There's a dictatorship there. You were the mayor of the largest city in the country. Why don't you pick it up from there? Well, as you said, um, I was I was mayor of uh, Caracas, of Central Caracas, and in two thousand eight, uh, I was running for higher office, and they this this took me out of the ballot box. They disqualified me for no reasons. They made up a case, so I had to reinvent myself again. I had done it before, so I decided to start a new movement. It was um, grassroots, youth oriented, uh, and social. Uh, active movement that had the thinking of uh, nonviolent action. So for three years, we built uh, that movement at the end of 2013. 2013 was a year where Maduro stole an election, but we also won uh, a, a municipal um, election. Uh, and we had a great presence all over Venezuela. So in January of 2014, 10 years ago, we decided to call for protest for nonviolent action to the streets in order to, to open opportunities for change towards democracy in Venezuela. And tens of thousands of people came out. Um, we actually called Maduro for what he was, for a dictator being uh, corrupt, repressive, and also with links to narcotics. And people came out on the thousands. And Maduro showed his ugly face by repressing um, and killing and um, detaining and torturing a lot of people. So there was a warrant for my arrest uh, because I was leading this protest. I went into hiding um, and then I decided among three options that I had, you know, turning myself in, um, going to exile or staying in hiding, hidden. I decided to turn myself in and I did it thinking um, on Martin Luther King uh, and his way of expressing what nonviolent action is. And he says in a letter uh, from Birmingham prison, he says, nonviolent action is about showing the scars of the petrified system in order to get collective, collective action and consciousness towards change. Um, so thinking in, in that respect, I decided to turn myself this, not knowing that it was uh, an unjust justice. So I was uh, detained after I turned myself with a huge, huge crowd, uh, around half a million people came out, all dressed in white, all nonviolent. And the 18th of February, 10 years ago, a couple of days, uh, I was sent to a military prison where I spent the next four years, most of the time in solitary confinement. Uh, I was sentenced to 14 years of imprisonment. And the judge uh, made uh, that ruling, that decision, because she accused me of the art of the speech and she claimed that although I never called for violent action, I had the capacity to send subliminal messages to the Venezuelan people in order for them to be violent. So on that ground, I was sentenced to 14 years. Um, then at the end of 2017, with another cycle of protests, uh, they decided to send me to house arrest. And in the year 2019, we organized through the National Assembly and interim government. And uh, um, at the uh, mid of uh, 2019, I, 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 I escaped. Uh, oh, we're going to get to your escape, <laughs> which is an amazing story. I want to go back to when you decided to turn yourself in. And you knew the charges were trumped up. You knew they would put you in jail. You probably didn't know for how long, but you knew it would be for an extended period of time. You knew you were going to leave your family you knew you probably had a sense that solitary confinement or at least being out of the general population was a part of it. The, the thing that I find astonishing is how did you prepare for that? Um, because you, 
you were so inspired by Dr. King. I know that in how you led your movement and in nonviolent action. How did you prepare to be put in jail for an extended period of time and, and left by yourself? Well, I, um, I was able to prepare uh, because six months before I went to prison, there was a warrant for my arrest and they took it back. So that faced me with that real scenario. So I decided to learn more about what imprisonment meant. So I read different things. I read um, the experience of Mandela, the experience of Gandhi, the experience of many Venezuelan leaders, because the history of Venezuela over the past two centuries has been one of uh, in imprisonment, exile, and politics. Um, so of all of that that I read, one thing was a constant that was uh, having a routine in prison, having a routine. So I was very conscious of, of kind of that one thing that was present in all of the experiences I read about. So mm -hmm. the night I was sent to the third floor of uh, Annex B in the military prison of Ramo Verde that is at the top of a hill with um, over 500 military prisoners, over 400 military guards around. I was um, a civilian. So um, it was all very new to me, that reality of, of, the, of the military, of the dictatorship. And that night, I remember it very well, because that night I said, well, what's going to be my routine? And I came up with a, a very concrete uh, routine that, that I uh, was previously familiar to, but not, not in that way. That was, I decided to do three things every day. I decided that I was going to pray, that I was going to exercise my mind, either reading, writing, drawing, trying to play music that I was not good at, and, and exercising, doing physical exercise. So um, I did those three things, Simon, every day with sport and discipline. Um, and that was the way I was winning every day. So another, um, I, another advice I got uh, from another political prisoner was, be conscious of time. I didn't know what, what that really meant. Uh, but what it meant for me at the time was that I was not going to become a prisoner of time and the expectations because I saw how other prisoners always believed the idea that they were going to be freed in a week, in a month, in three months. And when that moment came and they were not relieved, they collapsed. So I decided that I was going to win every day. That, that was under my control. Every, the only thing I could say is I would go to bed every day, go to sleep, knowing that I did the three things that make me win the day. And that's what I did. And of course, you know, four years is a long time, but that was the core of my how, every day how, how do you define winning at the end of the day? Do, doing the things that I was set out to do. So, you know, if I pray and I did honestly, if I... I wrote, read at, at moments. I had books. Yeah. Uh, so I, would, I was reading three books per week. Uh, then they took the books away from me. So I had nothing. So it was, you know, how to exercise the intellect, either, you know, counting different parts of the cell, doing some math, trying to play, you know, chess in my mind or with some marbles and, uh, and then exercising. Uh, so I learned to exercise in, in confinement only with my body weight. Uh, and I would do, you know, hours of, uh, of, of exercise. So at the end of the day, if I did those three things, I said, I won the day. Yeah. What, what, what did, were you a disciplined person before you went in? Like, were you exercising on a regular basis? Did you pray on a regular basis? You know, like, were you, are you a pretty disciplined person before you went or did you, did you learn discipline as a coping mechanism? No, I, I, I can say I'm a, I'm a disciplined person. Um, Yes, I did pray, but like for me, it was really about an introspection. So praying is really about an introspection. And I learned something very, very powerful that um, a priest once told me. He said, you know, people pray for three reasons. I, I told you this before, yeah. I think. Um, I've repeated, I've repeated for, it many, many times. Uh, people pray for need, people uh, pray for fear, or people pray for gratitude. And he said the most effective one is gratitude. So I had kind of that, you know, that, 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 that idea. So I started practicing that. I want to interrupt there because that's worth repeating. I want to say this again really slowly, which is the priest told you that people pray for three things. They pray for need. 
please let me win the lottery. Please let me win the game. Please let me get the job. Please make get me better, right? They pray for fear. I Please, I hope this doesn't happen. Make this pain end, right? That kind yeah. of thing, right? Uh, and then they pray for gratitude. And what he told you was, is that 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 most people most people pray for need or fear but it's gratitude that is the most valuable yeah and you yeah. decided every day not to pray to get out of jail not to pray to make the pain end not to pray to see your family you prayed for gratitude every day is that right yeah yeah that is profound because i think most people would pay, pray for the thing they miss and and I want to know what value it had. Like, how did praying for gra- how do you pray for gratitude when you're in a cell in solitary confinement? Like, how did what were you grateful for? So I have uh, so, so many things uh, to be grateful for. So many. So um, you know, I, I decided that this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it very honestly. So um, I started doing uh, kind of a, a map of my life since the beginning. You know, I am a, a very lucky person because I met my four grandparents. I have uh, my parents are incredible people. I have great siblings. I had a, a good upbringing. I, food was never missing from my plate. I got a good education. Um, I did all the sports that I wanted. I had a great time when I was a kid. Uh, and, uh, and I had the opportunity to study abroad, the opportunity to come to the United States, study here all the way through grad school. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, to live in Venezuela, to be mayor and to build a movement. And then, you know, I started also being grateful for small things. So one day, you know, I had a crack in my cell. My cell was two by two meters, uh, very tall ceilings. And the window was blocked, but there was a part of the window at the the top, like uh, maybe 30 centimeters that you could see the sky. So one day, you know, I would see a full moon through that crack. So I was like, oh, man, this is, I need to be grateful for this as well. And started also to be grateful when I heard birds. So you start going to the simple things and mm-hmm. you get really strong. And then you're also, you know, praying to be close to your family because you're being grateful that, uh, that, that you recognize them. Um, and also there was for me, a very pragmatic thing that I wanted to be um, very careful of. If I prayed for my freedom every day, I would go into the same trap that I told you before, that time can play you. So if you have expectations on things that you really don't control, and you put your entire uh, well-being into that that you cannot control, you are very vulnerable. And when you're in prison, the one thing that I was very clear since the beginning is that, you know, the battlefield was no longer the streets, the people. I, I, I loved what I was doing. I mean, I, I, I love politics in the good sense, building movements, being with people, organizing leaders, you know, getting people aligned with a, with a common idea, you know, talking about freedom in a way, about democracy, about human rights, in a way that is vital to you. I loved what I was doing, but I knew since the day I went to prison, that the battlefield was my head, hmm. that, that that was the, the one thing that I was in control of hmm. and the one thing I needed to take care of. So you were in prison for four years and then they put you under house arrest. Why did they take you out of jail and put you in the house? Well, there were uh, protests, very intense protests at the time in Caracas and, and in Venezuela. Yeah. Um, so the protests had been going for three months. Uh, my wife, Lillian, was one of the leaders of those protests uh, in the streets. Uh, my movement, Voluntad Popular, was leading the protests uh, nationally. Um, so the ex-president of Spain, uh, Rodriguez Zapatero, who is very close to Maduro, he showed up um, one, one night at midnight with the vice president of Venezuela, and they said, uh, you know, we want to we, we, uh, wanna take you to house arrest. And I said, uh, I don't want to go to house arrest unless you free the rest of the political prisoners. Um, it was a tense discussion about what was happening in the streets. Of course, mm-hmm. I expressed that they were the ones responsible for the violence, for the repression, for the torture, mm-hmm. for the imprisonment. Um, so they left. They came back. And when they came back, I had the opportunity of getting other prisoners 
to send me, uh, to get, to pass me a phone. So I recorded a message uh, supporting the people to, to continue to protest. And mm -hmm. it came out just when the vice president was sitting with me at the military prison. So they got furious and they sent me to confinement, 45 days, complete, complete, you know, in a, in a smaller cell, no contact with anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, afterwards they, they came and then they took me to house arrest and uh, as a way of diminishing the pressure of the protests that were taking place. So being at house arrest, I called for protests again, and they sent me back to military prison. And that was, uh, that that was a, a, tough, uh, a, a tough comeback to, yeah. to, to, to hell, because, you know, in a way I'd gone to purgatory. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I met my, my family. I experienced the warmth of my house. Yeah. You know, with my kids, my kids were small. My, my kids were four years, uh, my eldest, Manuela, and one year, uh, Leo, my son, um, when I went in. So when I went out, they were, you know, eight and five. Yeah. So. Uh, Did it work the second time, the routine? You know, the second time it was, uh, I kind of had a, I had a shocking uh land to that to, to that new uh cell that i was thrown into it was a completely white cell very very cold uh the night they took me back so when i was in house arrest i had to take uh three pictures every day as you as, as if you are a hostage you know with a with a newspaper yeah, yeah. and the guards and uh, taking a picture so that, uh, that that happened three times a day every day so one day they came at midnight and uh, they said you need to take another picture so i opened uh, the, the door of my house and all of this is, is in video because I had a, there was a camera recording this and there were like eight people uh, around the door they just pushed me into a car and sent me back to the military prison oh, where I was the, when I came in the old guards that were there that were only dedicated to be uh, the guards in, in, in my cell uh, they said welcome back you know, welcome back and now you know, now you will see another dose of, of the acid. Uh, they were completely, you know, you, 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 I don't think that everybody knows evil. You know, I, I really don't. Yeah. I didn't. Before I went to prison, I didn't, I mean, I, I knew what bad behavior was. I knew what bad people were. I knew, yeah. you know, what resentment was. But evil, evil, I mean, somebody that, I, I call evil somebody that um, gets, feels good by inflicting um, despair and pain on somebody else. That, yeah. That's what I you know, believe is evil. And, uh, and I saw that uh, in, in prison. And these people, you know, they were there, um, uh, kind of gave me the welcome. So at the beginning, I, it was tough. So I spent the next day, you know, like three, four, five days, uh, really, really shocked. Um, but then I took the routine. Uh, yeah. I could only walk. I could only exercise and, and pray. I had nothing. I had nothing. I mean, there was no mattress. There was nothing in the cell. Just a white, cold cell with no notion of time, no notion day or night. I mean, the, I mean, to, that is that is torture. I mean, you know, to remove any sense of time or night and day, to remove all contact with human beings. I mean, solitary confinement is a form of torture. You know, people go crazy in those conditions, you know, uh, even outside of prison, when people are isolated, you know, it plays, it wreaks havoc on the mind. How did you, how did you, I mean, I know it's, I, I, I apologize if it's a silly question, but how did you come out of this healthy? <laughs> or maybe you didn't. <laughs> Well, I mean, a, a, a couple of things. Um, primarily, you know, my family, really. Yeah. Uh, my family. My wife is a wonderful woman. Um, not only my wife, uh, but she became, you know, my voice. And she was leading the protest at the same time she was taking care of the kids. Yeah. At the same time, she was traveling all over the place. Uh, so she met with many, many presidents. Um, she met with Trump. She met with Biden. She met with presidents from... Uh, all over the region, from Europe, from members of parliament. She met the Pope. Uh, and at the same time, she was taking care of the kids and being a good mother. 
So th- and my mother as well. And but how does, only- how does that how does that keep you sane when you're isolated? It keeps and you sane them? because you know that you have a lifeline. That you know that you, there are people out there um, that love you, and uh, and that gives you kind of a reason to to be sane. It's like you know I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. You, you know what I I thought about this of course a lot, but I always thought about it as. I am going to take this challenge. I am the yeah. owner of my head. You know, for me, yeah. it was really not giving space to mental weakness. And yeah. and I was always on guard, mentally speaking, always on guard. And yeah. always, you know, I, for example, I was in a military prison and I, I am a civilian, but I knew I was in a military prison. So every day at 6 a.m. they would come and see if I was there. Uh, so every day without a watch, just biologically, I would wake up around 5.30. I had a bucket of water because I didn't have running water. I had a bucket of water, would wash my, my head. I would have my, the mattress I had in the floor perfectly with the, with the, with the sheets. Yeah. And I was just there, you know, sitting. Never allowed them to see me in a position of, of weakness. They never allowed me to see them in a, in, in a position, uh, yeah, of, of not being in control. So... And that for me started in my mind, and it was it was intense, but it was kind of the the challenge that I, that I had with me. Uh, this this question might be informed from seeing too many movies, but you know these are as you said these are sadists who at times enjoyed hurting you and seeing you suffer, and here you are defying that and not giving them the satisfaction and being ready at six o'clock in the morning, your bed made, you know, sitting there cheerful. Did they did they hurt you? Did they beat you to try and one up? Well, my, you? my my case uh, was taken to the UN to the Human Rights Commission. Yeah, and uh, the Human Rights Commission determined that I was a, a victim of torture. Yeah. Um, so uh, and also many other NGOs. I was uh, um, a prisoner a prisoner of conscience for Amnesty International. Yeah. That for political prisoners is kind of like the Oscar recognition because they <laughs> they do a a thorough analysis of every person really i mean it's uh, it's a very low percentage of the political prisoners in the world that have this recognition and i believe there are many many more that deserve it but it's just the way it is so yeah um yes i i was a victim of torture but to tell you the truth i um never assumed the position of being a victim yeah because i think if you assume yourself as a victim and particularly in a, in an intense experience as prison with the people who are your guards yeah. are not just guards. I mean, these people were politically enemies. Not them, because many of them were were close and they showed sympathies, but then they put others that were clearly very political. And imagine being in solitary confinement in a cell with a camera and your worst enemy is behind that camera and anything you do is going to go on live TV in order to just yeah. destroy your reputation. Yeah, yeah. So it was li- being in solitary confinement, but at the same time, knowing that there was a camera, that there were microphones, um, and that was that I was not alone. Yeah. So so you, was, you were, that, you that were, work, you were working harder. for the movement every day by protecting your reputation, because the minute your reputation faltered, it would hurt, it would hurt the movement. Yeah. And, and also just just um, knowing that, that that that's exactly what they wanted, you know, that that they wanted basically um yeah to break you we need to go back to your story and how you escaped because you escaped from jail which is given how long you were there a pretty remarkable thing can you can you recount that that insane story yeah so i um i actually escaped twice so i escaped from um from in house arrest uh this is april of 2019 uh, the the president of the National Assembly became the interim president. Another cycle of protests, peaceful protests, but massive, taking place in Venezuela and all over the world. Uh, there was a lot of pressure. And the interim president, he was from my political party, so we were well, very aligned and working together. So I started to have contact with um, different people from the military and the police ranks of the dictatorship. Uh, at one time, I received a, a ciphered message, the self-destructive message by Signal, 
um, with the face of a general and a, and a person there. A couple of uh, days afterwards, this person shows up to my house. He says, we, we want to explore working with you. These are people from the military, high ranking. So I said, if you are who you say you are, allow me to have meetings here. Uh, so I had different contacts with people from the military, from the police and other sectors. Um, and I had, throughout three weeks, meetings with the head of the political police, uh, the military who were in charge of all of the administrative um, buildings in the capital of Caracas, uh, the head of um, one of the important squads of, uh, of, of, of the uh, police of Maduro. They all came at different moments. Uh, actually, one of them was, um, he told me that he, one reason he was sitting there is because he was in charge in the intelligence police to analyze me when I was in solitary confinement. And he said, I was very impressed by all of the books that you were reading. By, by the, everything that I read, I had a camera on top of me. So they knew everything that I wrote, everything that I read. And, uh, and he said, I, I read uh, everything because I wrote, you know, I wrote two books while I was in prison. Um, and and uh, so he said, one of the reasons I'm sitting here is because of that. So that gave me the opportunity to, to talk to them. By the way, I asked all of them, why are you here sitting with me? And they said, after they said, because of Venezuela, because of the situation, they all said, we're sitting here because of sanctions, because we either have them and want them lifted or we are fearing them. So I have a very personal take on those who say that sanctions don't work because I have seen them, mm. you know, at first hand, how they can inflict behavior and they can be effective. Mm. So at the end of April of 2013, to make a, a 2019, to make a long story short, um, there was a, uh, I was released by my captors. So at, at 4.30 a.m., they came to my house, a convoy, military, police, and I have all this on record. <laughs> I, uh, I opened the door of my house. I had two um, uh, electronic um, ankle bracelets, uh, went out of my house, kissed my wife, told Lillian, oh, this is a risk we're taking, and went with them to a place where we gathered um, the interim president. We called for protest, and tens of thousands of people came out. Many more military came out, but we had uh, also uh, planned that there was going to be a decision by the Supreme Court at the time that they were uh, going to disqualify Maduro and call for elections. So that was going to produce another cycle of uh, people from the military uh, to defect and to support uh, the calling for uh, elections. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So we got a wave of repression. We started uh, shooting. Uh, uh, there was a lot of shots. It was very, very complicated. And um, we went to the place in Caracas where the embassies were. So the people who were in uniforms, they started to change their uniforms. And um, we found different uh, embassies. I first went to the Chilean embassy, and then found um, refuge for many of the people that were with us that day. Uh, and then since the Chilean embassy had many uh, refugees there, um, I went to the uh, Spanish embassy. Um, and I stayed at the Spanish embassy for a year and a half. My wife and my one-year-old, uh, they were with me for the first month. So I first uh, had to organize the escape of my wife. She escaped uh, by the coast of Venezuela. And then after a year and a half, um, at the end of 2020, I made the decision that I, it was time for me to leave. It was one of the toughest decisions for me to make because... Um, I never wanted to leave Venezuela. I even, you know, publicly said I will never leave my country. And having to take by my own words and my own conviction was uh, very tough. Mm -hmm. But my my mother was very sick. She was go going uh, through that dialysis. She needed a liver uh, transplant, a uh, kidney transplant. Um, I had not seen my father for seven years, my parents. I had not seen my kids for two years. And the ambassador of Spain was changed. So all of that came together and I decided to, to that was the moment to escape. So I um, decided to call a friend that uh, had always been with me and we've done different extractions in Venezuela of different people because, I mean, we've been under heat for many, many years. Uh, so I called him and he knew that at some point I was going to call him and just said, hey, man, you know, you know, all right. Uh, so I knew that he was going to put together a plan. So it was COVID at the time. And um, he analyzed four ways of leaving Venezuela through sea. It was impossible because the entire coast was closed because of COVID. 
uh, the um, western border to Colombia was impossible because it was taken by many, many different military police, paramilitary groups. Uh, the west coast was complete jungle, so we decided to go complete south uh, to the Orinoco River. So the day of, uh, of the escape, I, um, I left the embassy in the, uh, with, um, with, with the help of um, somebody from the embassy. And uh, I was changed to a car. Then we went to a basement and I met my friends. They were my friends, you know, <laughs> people. And I said, all right, man, this is the plan. All right, well, so what's the plan? So we have, uh, there was a car of the electricity company. Venezuela is Venezuela. It's a Latin American country. It's a Caribbean country. Even though there is a dictatorship, it's not North Korea. It's not China. So my friend, you know, is a mover and shaker. He's a, so he knows a friend that worked at the electricity company. The, the car uh, needed to go to the shop and he and the company was not going to pay for it. And he said, hey, man, I'll, you know, I'll take it to the shop. I'll fix it. I just, you know, for a couple of weeks, I need to use, I need to use a truck for, you know, bringing things from my company, he said, okay, so he fixed the car and we had an official car uh, with official license plates, with official everything. And then we had a second car and it was a car of the electricity company. So we were all um, in, uh, so he handed us the, the, the hats, the t-shirts the and I had a credential. And so we trained for 45 minutes. So if you're in a disguise operation, there are two things, you know, this is Spycraft 101. You need to do two things. You need to be very clear about two questions. Who are you and why are you here? And the technical, the technical description of this is status of being and status of action. Who are you? And you can go down a rabbit hole in each of those two questions. Name, last name, name of your parents, you know, place of birth, profession, date of birth, you know, how many kids, siblings, wife school, you know, everything. You can go down a rabbit hole. And why are you here? You need to be very clear, you know, who was each one of us within the, the electricity commission. So after 45 minutes of training, we decided to go. go. The, uh, it was COVID. It was uh, very, very uh, low, low traffic. So we went through like uh, 20 checkpoints um, with no problem because we had the, you know, we had the, the, the masks and we had all of the documentation. And at the end, in the border between Venezuela and Colombia, uh, the, of the Meta River, there was a, the last last checkpoint. There was nobody there. It was barbed wire and, and the excess of the, uh, of, or like the two barbed wire holders. Nobody was there. We went to uh, to to the river, uh, uh, to the bank of the river. We were on the boat, and all of a sudden, like eight military come with their AK-103 pointing at us, hey, 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 who are you? you? need to come back. We go back and we were caught. And they started frisking us. So who are you? So it's to say names. Um, and one of them, one of my friends, and we had planned this, he was the leader. And at, at, at all times, he was going to take leadership of the communication and the interaction. So um, he gets taken to uh, interrogation. They strip. Uh, Nate him, they see everything and they found some cash that we had precisely for that type of circumstance. He says, so who are you? You, you are not, a, you know, you're not from the electricity company. You know, you're, why are you going to Colombia? So he said, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Um, I am not uh, from the electricity company uh, and I have a case against me. Uh, but it's political. No, 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 no. It's not political. It's financial. So he says, I'm going to call the general. In the meantime, I was waiting and I was playing sick. I was playing COVID. So that was my role. I was just coughing and coughing. I had a huge, huge uh, mask and, and glasses and a hat. And I was coughing. And um, they never actually asked me to take my mask out. Uh, remember, it's the end of 2020. Vaccine was not around the corner. Certainly not for Venezuela. You know, remember the psychosis that everybody had. So they, they decided never to ask me to take my mask down. And, um, you know, I was just thinking, you know, this is, I'm not going to go back. I told my friend, we sat down in the sidewalk and I said, you know, we had the river like 30 meters away. And I said, <clears throat> I just want to let you know that if they come from us, I'm, I'm just going to jump in the river. Just, just so you know, man, I'm just going to, 
I'm not going to let them catch me without uh, without resistance. So my friend inside uh, gets the tells the the, the the lieutenant. He says, "Well, uh, you can call the general, but you know what's going to happen. He's going to stay with you know with all of that, uh, and you're going to get none." So he thought about it for like 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Said, "All right, go." So you know, my friend just getting putting his pants on, getting his 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 shirt. Says, "Let's go, let's go, let's go." And uh, we went to uh, to to the river. Uh, we crossed, and on the other side, it was guerrilla infected terrain because the FARC and the LN are in that part of Colombia. So we we had. Um, contacted President Duque, and he sent a military, a disguised military deployment to, to receive us because it was, you know, I could have gone from prison in Venezuela to being a hostage of the LN terrorist group. So they, we got there. Then um, I called my wife from there. So I called her. She was in Spain with my kids. And I say, uh, you know, just basically told her, I'm, I'm out. Where are you? Where are you? No, no, I'm out. I'm in Colombia. I, say, oh, I can't believe it. So, uh, uh, yeah, I landed a plane uh, to Bogota. In Bogota, I met the, uh, uh, some people from Bogota, some, my, my friend, who, another friend who had organized a contact with the, with the president of Colombia. And, um, and the members of the U.S. Embassy were there as well. So we had a conversation, and that a couple, an hour or so after, put in a, in a plane to, to the U.S., um, and then the next day I flew to, to Madrid, uh, with a different ID and just, uh, landed in Madrid, COVID completely deserted, completely deserted. And I just went to my house and uh, saw my family and uh, not seen my kids for many years and not seen my parents for seven years. And, um, it was, uh, it was incredible, but it was tough as well because, you know, I never wanted to leave my country. And I was going from, you know, imprisonment and all of that uh, uh, situation to confinement uh, because of COVID. So it was uh, it was a tough landing. Um, and then uh, started thinking, well, what do I do now? You know, how do you know, this is my new reality? And, and that's what you need to do when you reinvent yourself. And it, it happens to people all the time. Right. Uh, but the most important thing is to recognize I need to reinvent myself. This is my circumstance. This is it. Now I'm in exile. Um, I'm not in front line in Venezuela. Um, so what do I do? And that's why I started to meet other people who, like me, were in similar circumstances. And that's how we, we gathered the, 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 the idea of putting together the Alliance of the World Liberty Congress. And you know what's been interesting for me is um, the work I'm doing now is I, we're, we're building an alliance of democracy defenders and freedom fighters yeah. at, at a global level. Yeah. So this is a very unique group of people. Uh, so these are people, a group of people from 56 autocratic regimes. Uh, we gathered last year uh, more than 300. And over 50% of the people have had, at some point, uh, they've been unlawfully detained. 30% of the people have uh, had, at some point, an attempt on their life. Yeah. 150% have been victims of smear campaigns. <laughs> so it, it, it's really interesting to talk to people who have also gone through this. Yeah. And, under, and, and it's, it's incredible, Simon, to talk to people from Africa, from Asia, from Eastern Europe, uh, from the Middle East, that we are completely different, you know, skin color, religion, institutions, sports, you know, we, we couldn't be more different. But when yeah. we talk about this, we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. You know, how do you endure uh, being a political prisoner? How do you keep the movement going? Yeah. How do you keep faith? How do you fall and stand up again? Because it's all about standing up. Yeah. This is a fight that, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it, as of now, if you see the statistics, it's, it might be an impossible fight. Yeah. Because there has been no transitions to democracy in um, 24 years of the 24th century. But there are more people wanting to fight for freedom. Yeah. And I think what's very powerful is to share these ideas, to share this commitment, and to know that, yes, it's idealistic, but idealism in the end is what changes the world. What is one thing that you've done in your life, a project, uh, anything, 
it doesn't even matter if it's successful or not, but something you've done in your life that you absolutely loved being a part of. And if everything that you do in your life from this point on was like that one thing, you, you, you'd be the happiest person alive. <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I, I love being mayor. I, I was mayor for eight years. I was elected mayor very young. I was 27 at the time. Uh, and for me, it was just a dream job Yeah, for many reasons. I was at the heart of Caracas. It was very political at the time. But I was able, you know, I, I went to grad school, studied public policy, and uh, just I, I had uh, training as an economist. But I had all of these ideas of how to change the city. And I brought, I put together an incredible team of people, incredible, most of them very young, very um, committed, very well educated in their areas of expertise. And we completely changed the city. We, you know, we, we made it the safest uh, uh, municipality in, in Venezuela when Venezuela and Caracas was the most dangerous city in the world. Uh, we had an incredible police. I brought, you know, Bill Bratton from New York City. Uh, we, we put together the Comstat uh, system that was developed in New York City. We brought crime rates, you know, completely to the floor. Uh, we changed the tax uh, laws, uh, municipal laws. So we um, we did less taxation with incentives for different industries. We made we made taxation very simple, uh, and of course we increased uh, the, uh, the the resources. We became autonomous, so we were able to build schools. What's one specific thing you did while you were mayor that sort of sums up the magic of being the mayor? Well, this you, you're going to laugh maybe because. Uh, you know, I think it's what really sums up the entire experience is that I would run every day around the municipality and uh, I would just go into the different areas of the city. I would, I would just, you know, with, with no invitation, no, not, not telling anybody, I would go into a school and I would talk to the teachers and to the students or I would talk to the police in the streets or I would go to a healthcare system and I would go and, uh, and talk to the, the sweep the people that were sweeping the streets. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it was just a way of being hands-on on what I was doing with the people that were doing it. And we had this great aura of we are doing an incredible service. We actually summarized, you know, you, you have this entire discussion of mission and vision and you bring in a, a consultant and they do, you know, all of this research, all of this analysis, and they come up with a paragraph. This is your, you know, this is your mission. And then nobody remembers uh, so what I, what I told the, the people in the municipality, our mission is to be the best ally of the citizen. And everybody in this municipality, every department, every institute has to complete that sentence. So for the police, it was be the best ally of the citizen to safeguard the people and the property of the municipality. For the healthcare people, be the best ally of the citizen to provide public health and caretaking of the people. And you can go, you know, kind of completing that line to the people who are taking care of the offices. And you say, all of us are part of the same mission. And we had this kind of this great commitment. And it was very intense because at the same time, the municipality where I was mayor was the heart of all of the protests. And I was always involved in the protest. So, you know, at, at times, millions of people would come to protest. Um, and some protests lasted for months. So parts of the, you know, we had our own Maidan Square or our own Tahir Square, and it was all in my municipality. So it was, uh, you know, I think that, that that contact with the people summarizes. And I do try yeah. to take that. You know, my, my wife, we don't, we don't, of course, I'm in exile. And I remember my wife a couple of, a couple of uh, years ago, she, she said, we were, I think it was in Norway for the Oslo Freedom Forum. And uh, she she said, why are you, you know, why are you saying hello to everybody? And I said, you're not, you know, you're not going to be mayor of Oslo. And I said, no, this is what I do. You know, I just like to say hello to people. I just like to, you know, to learn from people. And you just learn listening to people. And I just, uh, I mean, I just, I, uh, that's, that's what I, you know, really take away from my experience as mayor. Just being in the streets, talking it. to people T and motivating people as well. Motivating people T Tell me an early, an early specific happy childhood memory. Not like we went to my grandparents every weekend. Something specific that I can relive with you. An early specific happy childhood memory. 
Well, uh, the the uh, first time that I, uh, I, I I do a lot of horseback, um, so uh, we have the the national sport in Venezuela. It's uh, it's called toros coleados. Is that you basically go? It's an incredible sport. It's an extreme sport. You have uh, um, a line of like 150 meters. You have four riders with the horses with helmets four minutes and one bull. And then the bull goes out and you need to take the tail of the bull and you you let go of the reins and you pull the bull and twist it. And then you get some points. So the first time I did that was a very happy, was a very, <laughs> was a very happy moment. What the hell? There, there, there's something about you. Like those two stories I find really interesting, right? Because in both cases, it's about being hands-on. Right. It's about getting dirty, being out there, taking the risk, right, putting yourself out there. You know, the, the proverbial grab the bull by the horns. In your case, it's grab the bull by the tail. <laughs> uh, uh, but there's something to be said for um, not sitting at the desk, not playing jigsaw puzzles at home, not playing video games, but to get out on the horse and ride out and and. And and literally take take the risks to be out there because the thrill and the learning is more intense and more extreme and more valuable than anything you can learn reading about it at home or watch or being a spectator. Yeah, you I'm, know you can't you can't be a spectator mayor and most mayors are spectators. You know you to be truly a mayor you have to be involved. And to be truly a player, you have to be involved. You have to grab the bull by the tail. And in your case, you not only live your life by being involved and getting, putting yourself out there, but your inspiration for others to get involved, you know, be the best ally of the city by dot, dot, dot. You're inviting people to get on the horse and grab a bull. You know, you're, you're passionate about leading social movements because you're inspiring people to get out there, get on the horse and grab a bull. And there's, there's something to be said for, you know, there's something to be said for, 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 for doing it, for going out, for going out there. And whether, and if you lived in a democracy, you would be the same human being. Uh, you would be out there. You would be grabbing the bulls. You'd be doing the difficult things, meeting the people and it's still inspiring us to gather and still inspiring us to be the greatest allies of the city it just so happens that skill set worked really well when we needed to fight against a democracy. Uh, if we, that skill set worked really well when we needed to fight against a dictatorship. Yeah. Right place, right, place, right place, right time. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, that in a way you, you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. Yeah. <laughs> no, and you like. You the... show up on a freaking horse and <laughs> grab a bull. I mean, like, that sums you up so freaking perfectly. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I don't know why I thought of this because I mean, just came with a question, but that's a, the first thing. And but it's uh, who you like. I mean, it it sums you up perfectly. Everything we've been talking about today, the balls that you have, you know, to do the things that you do, and even your escape plan. I mean, your escape story is insane. You're sitting in the back of this car pretending you have COVID and coughing. I mean, just like the whole thing is madness. But that's who you are. There's an insanity to you, but it's, it's for the, it's for the, it's, it's for good. Yeah. Well, we always joke about it, you know, in, in, in our movements that you need to be a little bit crazy and you need to, uh, to, to fight for freedom. And I, I don't think it's crazy. I think idealism, you know, is that, I mean, if you, you cannot be a, a boring idealist, you know, I mean, and if you take your idealism <laughs> as <laughs> To the extreme, you have to act, right? I mean, if, if yeah. you have to act because, I mean, idealism is about really, you know, putting your action where your where your heart, where your thoughts are. So you need to act. You need to do something about it. And and I also think that you need to do it with the right attitude. You know, it, I think it's very very important always to be capable of putting a smile to adversity. <laughs> saying, all right, man, here we go again, you know, and just, just really, really uh, being capable of, 
yeah, putting a smile to adversity. I think that that is yeah. important um, for teams to be cohesive, to be motivated in moments of great difficulty. You know, just just gotta gotta give it, you know, the good vibe to the fight. <laughs> Leopoldo, I could talk to you forever. We've, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you've given me, you've been so generous with your time, even today. I, I will tell you one thing. You inspire me and I will follow you anywhere. Oh, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. You, you too Truly. as well. And, uh, and I want to I wanna share with you something. I, I, I told you, but um, in, in the Liberty Congress, we recently had a, a meeting. And um, so we, we met the, the people were planning what we we're going to do, 24, 25. And we had the different programs, the different um, people responsible for it. And said, so this is what we're going to do today, you know. Everybody is going to talk about, you know, the why of the things that they are uh, that they are engaged in, and it, it comes so natural to me, really. You know, for, it just yeah. it just you know when I read your, about your framework, it's it's so well explained. Um, but it just for me, it just comes very natural. So you know, we have now it's it's become so. <laughs> so what's your why, man? Remember why we're doing this and uh, well, we need to get you know the, the the what and the how we need to nail it down as well so. <laughs> yeah uh you, i mean i'm flattered that my work has made its way to support you and your and your work no, there's no greater honor oh thank you um, my friend thank you you're awesome thank you so so much i really appreciate it thank you see you soon my friend oh, i'll see you soon if you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And if you'd like even more optimism, check out my website, simonsinek.com, for classes, videos, and more. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of each other.